Welcome back to the Works Podcast, everybody. I'm your host, Samuel Ashkenazi. Today, we got a double feature for you. We've got director of the new film, In the Whale, director David Abel, and author of the book, Undergo, Amanda Russo, both on the podcast with us today. But first, a huge update for ScareWorks. We're going to be starting to work on our first major short. In the next couple weeks, we're going to be looking for crew, we're going to be looking for actors, we're going to be casting at least three major roles in this short. We really need everybody's support for this. We're This is just the preliminary announcement, there's going to be much more coming, um, but I just wanted to get you guys a, a taste of, of what we're thinking about doing here. Um, we're going to be shooting a short, our, our goal right now is for the summer. My team and I are already working on sets, locations, we're developing a production schedule. Um, there's a lot coming down the pipeline right now, so we just need you guys to bear with us. By the next episode, I'll have an even better update for you. Um, there's going to be also ways to uh, get involved as far as fundraising is concerned. Um, if you want to become a producer on a project uh, and dip your toes into filmmaking that you may have never done before, uh, this is going to be an opportunity. If you have dipped your toes into filmmaking, uh, we're an experienced team and we're going to need all the support that we can get. Um, so I don't want to keep talking. Um, we're going we're gonna to have more updates coming. I'm just super excited um, to, to finally say that we have something uh, in development right now. So um, just give me, uh, just, just give us to the next episode. Okay, now. Uh, now that we have that out of the way, um, as always, everybody, if you want to watch this full episode, you're going to have to watch it on Patreon. Subscribe for only $5 a month. Gets you full access to all of the works, including our movie reviews, our interviews, and just vlogs behind the scenes. Of course, we're also going to be doing some movie reactions on there. First one coming up is going to be The Blob. All right, so... Uh, stay tuned for that. I'm really excited to see uh, to see some movies with you guys also. David Abel is an environmental reporter for the Boston Globe and documentarian known for Sacred Cod. His new film, In the Whale, revisits one of the most attention-grabbing headlines of 2021 when a commercial lobster diver, Michael Picard, was swallowed alive by a humpback whale and lived to tell the story. I'm so honored this gentleman came to the podcast to speak with me today. David, thank you so much for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thank you uh, for having me. Um, so I wanted to dive right in, pun intended, uh, to your new movie, In the Whale. Um, I haven't seen it yet, but I will be at the March 1st showing at the Cinema Arts Center. Tickets are available in the description below. If you want to get tickets to that this Friday, come on down, give it a watch. You guys will not be disappointed. Um, coincidentally, uh, director of the Cinema Arts Center, Dylan Skolnick, will also be a guest on, the, on an upcoming episode. Uh, so look forward to that. We're going to have a great discussion with him as well about the cinema. Um, so going back to you, David, I, like where to begin? Uh, I guess first, can you describe like who Michael Picard is and run that headline by us like one more time? What exactly happened to him off the coast of Cape Cod? So... Michael, and I think he goes by the pronunciation Packard, Michael Packard is um, the last remaining commercial lobster diver on Cape Cod. And uh, he does something uh, that is extraordinarily dangerous and has become even more so in uh, uh, recent years as great white sharks have increasingly inhabited the waters off Cape Cod. And uh, in the summer uh, of 2021, he was on uh, uh, a routine dive. It was his third dive of the morning. Uh, and he was uh, basically uh, fishing off the coast of Provincetown, which is the town just off the tip of Cape Cod at the very end. And, um, and all of a sudden, his world went black. And, uh, and he at first thought that he was, uh, he, he, he thought that the concerns that everybody had raised with him and the reason why no one else was doing this uh, was because of the sharks. And he thought finally the shark got him. Um, but then he realized 
he was still very much alive and that he had not uh, been chomped up. And, uh, Thankfully. Uh, and, then, uh, and then the next thought was, uh, oh my God, uh, I'm in the whale, I'm in the mouth of a whale. And, um, and he um, uh, managed to uh, survive because he had a, scu a scuba gear on for a little less than a minute. Uh, when the whale spat him out and he apparently shot out according to the people who witnessed him uh, fins first because uh, all of the air in his dry suit sort of rushed to his legs as the uh, whale sort of just spat him out at the at the very uh, near the surface and he kind of shot out uh, and um, anyway he is the uh, the guy who was swallowed by the whale and lived to tell the tale. And I spent two years following him to look at what happens to a reclusive fisherman like Michael, who is suddenly thrust into the international limelight. The story ricocheted all over the world. And he um, uh, was, uh, you know, um, sort of the toast of the town for quite some time. But what, what happens to someone like Michael when all of a sudden uh, that spotlight dims? And huh. uh, and so I spent two years uh, with him uh, essentially trying to answer that question. You know, I, I read that when you first read about this story, um, you were kind of skeptical that it even happened. Um, when you first like met him, how did you go about like, debunking uh this story and trying to figure out if it actually happened or not yeah so uh like um you know most journalists at the least and many others uh there was reasonable uh concerns um uh and i've been uh, a reporter at the boston globe for many years i've covered um environmental issues and and uh and a lot of issues on the waters off cape cod and elsewhere around New England and um, and I'd never heard anything like this uh, before. And uh, I was, um, you know, um, I think the te technical term that my editors uh, uh, used was that it was likely bullshit. And so, uh, so- Is that a technical term? I think that's a technical journalistic <laughs> term, yeah. And so, um, and so uh, I was, asked uh to look into it and essentially to try to debunk it and uh and so i did what any reporter would do i i tried to interview as many people as i possibly could i interviewed um michael's mother i interviewed his sisters i interviewed the fishermen who claimed to pull him out of the water i interviewed um uh, other fishermen who knew michael i interviewed michael at length and I even got the 911 tapes, and then I had to go back to my uh, editors uh, and tell them that unfortunately, uh, I thought that the story was true. And so the next day I, I had a story on the front page of the Boston Globe with uh, perhaps the best headline of any story I've ever uh, written for the paper, which I can't take credit for because the reporters don't write the headlines, but it said, this fish story isn't hard to swallow. <laughs> that's great um is it i mean sure like great whites i could imagine attacking people but you know is it is it typical for whales to actually attack humans like that well i don't think it was an attack and no by by no means uh is this typical uh yeah it, it was it was probably an accident Mo it, it, most uh uh likely what happened was the whale was uh feeding uh with its mouth uh wide open uh humpback whales which was the kind of whale that uh ingested michael briefly uh um uh have their eyes on the sides of their heads and so when they feed apparently they don't see very well right in front of them and apparently what likely happened was michael was coming down the whale was was coming up, and somehow uh, Michael just got got in the mouth, and so um, uh, he um, you know uh, um, 
still continues to dive because he's not afraid of killer killer whales essentially trying to uh trying to eat other uh eat him again or eat other divers so you know you mentioned that he's not afraid he, he, and you also said that he's um the last among commercial uh lobster divers why is why is he the last because of the danger um danger from shark attacks or yeah no i don't think the whales uh uh are really the factor um yeah no the they're um the the short of the long is that um the rebound of gray seals off cape cod their their numbers uh were once quite low uh but uh over the last few decades their numbers have surged and with that has uh the great white sharks have increasingly inhabited those waters and uh there have been a few shark attacks someone actually died um um a few years ago uh a surfer and um anyway um you can just look on an app on your phone and see all of these uh uh shark uh sightings and uh anyway it's just uh a, a dangerous uh place to to do that line of work now so i mean you've been you've been covering these environmental issues uh for a while now um as an environmental reporter you're you're kind of up to date i think on both the most fascinating and terrifying stories of our time. Um, you know, because, I, you know, I'm growing up in the generation where we've been told that, you know, we're going to see the irreparable changes of climate change um, 10 years ago. And uh, if we don't do anything, you know, we're, we're doomed. And five years now past that, um, you know, I think um, my generation is like particularly concerned um with with climate and uh i mean the potential disasters that we're seeing on the horizon here um can you describe some of i guess the changes you've seen just in like the new england area um as far as like um climate change uh or or just environmental changes um in the in in and around new england Totally. Uh, so, yeah, I, I wouldn't say they're potential. They're happening. I mean, we uh, last year uh, we had a record number of billion dollar storms, uh, meaning storms that caused more than a billion dollars worth of damage in the United States. There were 28 of them uh, in 2023, which was by far a record, uh, exceeding the record in 2020. Uh, for uh, which I think had twenty-two billion-dollar storms in, in this in the '80s and the '90s, there were on average like a third of that number of storms, a third of storms of that level of damage. Uh, so we are seeing this not hypothetically. Uh, this is happening. Uh, I actually uh, just uh, this film that um, that I'm bringing to Long Island. Um, this weekend uh, is one of two films that I just released in October. Uh, the other film that I uh, recently made is called Inundation District. We're actually gonna be showing it at NYU uh, on Thursday night. And uh, that film is all about how, uh, how climate change is, um, is affecting sea level and uh, and how it threatens coastal development all around the world. And that film is through the prism of, um, of how, is told through the prism of how one city decided to spend billions of dollars building an entirely new urban district at sea level, on landfill, hard on the coast. And despite having uh, probably more climate scientists per capita than just about any other city on the planet, decided to build this new urban district in the bullseye of rising seas. And I'm referring to uh, uh, the seaport uh, mm. uh, in Boston. And uh, to make a, a long story short, we are already seeing uh, a significant flooding. Just uh, a few weeks ago, we had the fourth highest tides uh, in Boston on record, and we saw uh, major damage all along the eastern seaboard, um, uh, particularly 
uh, throughout New England, especially Maine, where they had the highest tides on record. Um, and lots of fishing areas were battered and, and so forth. So the reality is uh, this is happening, uh, and we're seeing it uh, all over the world. Um, we're seeing it with uh, uh, so-called atmospheric uh, rivers, I think they're called, um, and most, uh, you know, a few weeks ago in California. We're seeing it in major, um, uh, major wildfires like we saw last summer uh, in Western Canada, bring, which darkened the skies of New York City and many sure. other cities along the East Coast. We saw epic flooding uh, in places like Libya and Pakistan. And I mean, the list just goes on. You're also seeing like national story, you know, headlines like, you know, you can't get uh, insurance or home insurance in Florida, you know, because they're, the insurance companies are literally paying out too much to these natural disasters. Um, Absolutely. That- keep happening over and over again um you know when you're I, I, I honestly like reporting on that I don't know how you get don't get like bogged down um you know but I mean um one of the things that kind of perked my interest as I was doing research on you is a lot of the stuff that you've reported on even in just the last year are hopeful like it's solutions right um you covered um, the installment of this passive house office building in Boston, which may not be perfect, but it's you know it's an effort at least in the right direction. Um, you have um, this uh, cell based meat that you covered, um, and this kind of impo- you know this move towards impossible, impossible food. Um, what solutions do you see on the horizon that kind of make you hopeful? Um, or is it just not moving fast enough right now? Well, um, I think you're right to say it's it's hard to feel optimistic uh, uh, in a world where there's so much cognitive dissonance. Um, like with the film I just made, Inundation District, you know, you have people who uh, who absolutely recognize the threats of of rising seas, yet they're given incentives to build. Um, along the coast with minimal, if any, uh, protections uh, from rising seas and ultimately leaving uh, taxpayers um, uh, 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 on the dole, essentially, likely having to cover the costs of any kind of Sandy-style storm that could cause catastrophic flooding. Um, There are lots of other... um, reasons to feel uh to feel pessimistic uh in the sense that we um are not doing what we need to do on a global level to reduce our carbon footprint Um, we uh, need to cut our emissions roughly half uh, of what they were uh some 20 or so years ago um, um cut them from those levels in the, in like two, 2000, 2005 range, uh, yet uh, we're on target to do that. We're, we're, we need to do that by the end of this decade, and yet we're on target to increase uh, our carbon emissions by some 10%. Uh, we, uh, you know, every, every day there are new and depressing headlines about how our, uh, uh, we're continuing to invest um, globally and in the United States to a lesser extent, but still to a significant amount um, in the fossil fuel uh, infrastructure. And uh, and while the Biden administration has certainly steered our slow moving ship in a new and better direction uh, than the previous administration in terms of addressing climate change, uh, there are so many things that need to be done to get us there. But to answer your question about optimism and trying to remain uh, optimistic, I I like to say that, you know, there are deep and troubling political challenges that I don't know if we're going to actually solve to reduce the worst consequences of climate change, which means um, essentially trying to keep the planet from exceeding 
uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming, and we already just in the last 12 months, for the first time in on record in human history, I believe, um, have exceeded that temperature threshold uh, of having uh, on average temperatures exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial times uh, over consecutively over the past 12 months. That's not quite the threshold that scientists fear. It has to be a bit more sustained than just 12 months. And we're also undergoing an El Nino uh, slight warming period, which, which uh, amplifies temperatures. But to come back to the optimistic side of the ledger, I, I would just say that um, as depressing and, and hard as it is to process uh, the the misery and the challenges we're facing from warming temperatures, we also happen to be an incredibly innovative uh, and intelligent species. And we have been able to do things um, that uh, other, um, that, that boggle the mind in terms of, uh, of, finding solutions to seemingly intractable, intractable problems. And the example I like to give is just we uh, were able to do something that no one thought would be possible uh, just a few years ago uh, and save millions of lives by creating using mRNA technology to create these new vaccines, uh, which, which saved millions of people's lives all over the world in record time in, you know, in a year, we were able to not just create this new technology and test it, but distribute it to uh, uh, billions of people. Uh, so that is just a reflection of if we set our minds to accomplish uh, um, uh, a goal, we can do amazing things. And, and one of the things that I've written about uh, over the last few years, as you noted, uh, there are all kinds of really um, uh, amazing new technologies on the horizon that could offer us uh, a path uh, forward that would remove our need and reliance on fossil fuels. And one of those uh, things that you know has long been envisioned and and still may be hypothetical and still maybe pie in the sky is something called nuclear fusion. And, mm. uh, and uh, there has been, there have been some amazing breakthroughs uh, uh, on this front to create what would be effectively limitless uh, um, energy. form of energy uh, that uh, could be used to power just about everything um, uh, without the catastrophic uh, uh, consequences of carbon dioxide or methane pollution that come from burning coal or oil or natural gas. And, um, and my hope is, you know, with a lot of money behind these new efforts uh, and maybe, you know, bringing in uh, uh, generative AI and and the new and, and this other amazing new technology that you know just a year ago would have seemed to most people to be absurd to think that a machine could essentially write as well or if not better than the vast majority of human beings in seconds. Um, anyway, um, that that gives me hope. And uh, and while we can't rely on these new technologies, uh, and there's all kinds of uh, renewable technology today that actually is displacing our reliance on fossil fuels. Um, we we need to just go ahead on all of these fronts. Be, before you began uh, to focus more closely on environmental issues, um, you had a you had a pretty wide ranging career. I mean, you were even part of the team that uh, won the Pulitzer Prize for their coverage on the Boston Marathon bombings. Was was there like a point um, specifically that made you pivot towards environmental uh, stories? So um, I've covered, as you say, um, all kinds of things over the years. Um, I started out uh, reporting in Latin America. Um, I covered national security issues. I've covered 
um, poverty, um, and I think uh, um, I, I just started to gravitate toward writing environmental stories, and then as climate change became uh, a an increasing concern, uh, it demanded more coverage, and um, and that led me to uh, just focus more and more on these subjects. And if there's one story that I can think of that really um, uh, maybe crystallized my um, my interest and uh, and appreciation of how uh, there are that these are not distant abstract threats, but one that are uh, that that is affecting people here and now was the cod crisis and and uh, and seeing how um, uh, after generations and generations of fishermen in New England uh, made a living from cod, uh, all of a sudden, uh, despite you know generations of pressure uh, on this fishery, all of a sudden the species collapsed um, and it required a moratorium, a federal moratorium on cod fishing. Uh, which effectively remains in place today, um, uh, because uh, the the waters uh, in the Gulf of Maine, which are the waters off New England, which have been warming faster than just about any other body of water on the planet, maybe with the exception of Long Island Sound, um, uh, um, essentially made it impossible. Um, for the cod to bounce back. And we've seen the same thing play out uh, at least south of Cape Cod and especially in the waters of Long Island Sound with lobster. Um, and that was the subject. I made a film called Sacred Cod, which was all about the co collapse of uh, our iconic cod fishery. And then I made a film called Lobster War, um, which was also about the impacts of climate change on, on lobster. You know, touching on uh, Sacred Cod for a second, you know, that that came back, that was out in 2016, you made that? Uh, sounds about right. So in the years following, have you kept up with the story and, and how has things changed there, um, better or worse? Yeah, no, things uh, remain pretty, pretty much the same. You know, the cod fishery uh, is, uh, the cod population has yet to uh, rebound uh, in any significant way, as far as I I know, and uh, and um, and fishermen uh, uh, essentially their quota they they have like a minor small amount of quota uh, for cod, but that quota essentially is for bycatch. So they they're they're targeting other species like flounder uh, um, or uh, or sea bass or something and they catch some cod and so that's you know they they try to avoid it so that they don't get docked for essentially catching a species that they're not supposed to so being that you've been um a reporter for however however many years i mean you started out though writing uh for newspapers magazines etc what do you feel um filmmaking and docu documentary uh, filmmaking has given you uh, that you can't really explore uh, while you're writing. Well, I mean, I I think I see them as very similar uh, pursuits. Um, I just think they're they're uh, telling stories in different ways, and so you know each medium is given to uh, a different um, a different kind of story in some ways. Uh, but most of my films have been an outgrowth of my uh, my reporting for uh, the newspaper. And, uh, and there are stories um, that seem to lend themselves to being uh, told on a big screen. And, um, and I think to answer your question directly, there are certain things that you can do um, or there's a certain impact from a film that I don't know if you quite get um, in the same way with print. Uh, and I think that um, one of the most amazing things about, about films are you can convene audiences and everybody can sort of experience a story from the beginning to the end in one sitting. Uh, they last with people. They're visceral. They're emotive. They, 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 um, 
are um, engrossing and immersive in the ways that great literature is as well. But but I I think that um, it's it's just something that um, so years ago uh, when I first started to take an interest in filmmaking, I was working on a story and there, there was this one moment that sort of crystallized my interest in this. I I, I probably long had a prejudice against filmmaking uh, against not just filmmaking, but but the visual medium in that I thought it kind of dumbed down storytelling and that mm. was more base. And uh, one day I was working on a story about people who live aboard boats on Boston Harbor throughout the winter. And uh, I thought I had a really interesting uh, story about um, about just this really idiosyncratic and difficult way of life. Uh, but when um, we just hired our first video journalist at the Globe and her story um, uh, published alongside mine, and I was blown away by what she was able to capture. She was able to show uh, rather than tell in ways that I could only hint at in print. Mm -hmm. uh, like, you know, um, I could describe how frigid it might be on the boat, but when you actually see someone's breath exhaled you 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 feel it yeah. um or you can hear the howling of the winds or the creaking sounds of the boat or you know see how cramped these conditions are um uh the sallow light all of these things are uh ways of showing and and engross the viewer um and and hit them i think and and, you know, as I began to learn the grammar of making films, uh, I, I understood, you know, that is the power and strength of this medium. And if you can harness that, you can make, uh, you, you can tell stories in ways that I think last with people um, and sit with them. They don't, um, you know, it doesn't sort of escape their brain as quickly as maybe something in print might. Um, just a couple more questions for you. So um, you have a directing partner in uh, Andy Laub. Is that how you say his last name? Mm -hmm. um, so when you guys uh, decide on a project together, um, how do you divvy up the work? So um, I've known Andy uh, for quite a few years now. Um, he, he was actually a former student of mine years ago when I used to teach at Emerson College. And, um, and we got connected after the marathon bombings where I started learning how to, where I really started making films. Um, that's a whole long story, uh, but um, he's an editor and uh, he, he, he can do it all. I, the, the reality is that um, I like to say that I, I became the student and he became the teacher because he uh, knew so much and continues to probably know a lot more about making films than I do. Uh, he's super talented on so many levels. And, um, and I just learned a, a tremendous amount about how to use a camera from him, how to think cinematically. Um, and he's, he's just uh, fantastic. Um, we, we've made um, most of the films I've made uh, together. Um, um, and I've, he now lives in California. So, um, you know, I, uh, I've now sort of, I shoot the films and, and sort of uh, direct them and, and figure out, you know, what the, how to piece them together. And uh, for In the Whale, he, he cut it and scored it. And, um, and oh, it scored it. We, we go back, to, back and forth together. Very cool. Um, you know, touching right back to uh, in, in the Whale, um, you know, it's, it's a, you can't help but uh, see tons of metaphors uh, in this story. Um, you know, it's it's this kind of semi-biblical tale, uh, you know, also like reminiscent of fairy tales like Pinocchio. I mean, like all these different, you know, scenarios where people have ended up in a giant whale. I mean, so peculiar. Um, but I mean, um, specifically following Michael, I mean, did you learn anything about like the human spirit or anything about humanity um, from this from this strange story? Um, 
Well, I think you have to go to see the film to answer that question. <laughs> and there's your teaser, folks. That's that's it. Uh, you got to go check it out. Um, it's going to be at the Cinema Arts Center this Friday night. Um, outside of the Cinema Arts Center, where else can people find your stuff? So uh, we'll be showing it at the Cinema Arts Center on Friday. And then Saturday, we will be showing it at the West Hampton Performing Arts Center. Uh, and then on Sunday, uh, we'll be showing it at the Bronxville Picture House. Um, and, uh, and if anyone wants to come to NYU on Thursday night, uh, Inundation District will be uh, screening there. And you can just go on the websites for both films to see uh, other screenings that we have uh, scheduled for both. Uh, so inthewhalefilm.com. Uh, is uh, the uh, website for In the Whale and inundationdistrict.com is uh, the website for the other film. And those links will be available in the description below. Um, I want to thank David Abel for coming on the show today. Uh, we really appreciate him being here. Um, don't miss this movie. Um, it's going to be really good. I recommend it to anybody. David, thank you for coming on the pod. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me and I look forward to seeing you there. I'll, I'll be there. I'll, uh, I'll make sure to say hi to you. Okay, great. Thanks. And bring friends. I will. Absolutely. Okay, great. If you're local to Long Island, New York and need movie recommendations, subscribe to the Long Islander newspaper where you can catch my movie reviews and theater write-ups every week. We cover everything from local businesses, food and drinks, town events, and sports. Subscribe at longislandernews.com for only $35 a year. The Works Podcast is sponsored by Reset Lift. You know, I love going to the gym, but I need the right clothes to go in. Our friends over at Reset Lift have created the perfect gym attire for you, because their whole goal is to inspire you to be the best version of yourself. Go to resetlift.shop forward slash scareworks right now to get exclusive offers on t-shirts, tanks, hoodies, shorts, joggers, sweatpants, you name it, they have it. Use discount code SCAREWORKS at checkout to receive 10% off on merchandise. Next on the pod, I met our next guest at a networking event for creatives, and we struck up a great conversation. Amanda Russo is an author who just published her awesome new novel, Undergo. We're recording this bright and early, so please give a warm welcome for your couch or your bed or your car or wherever you're listening to Amanda Russo. Amanda, thank you for being here. Hi, thank you so much. I'm very excited. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to have you. And again, like we're recording this like super early and I'm so sorry to drag you out of bed to do this press, but, um, you know, we couldn't be uh, doing press on a more fun book. Um, Undergo is really just such, um, it's just a great time. You know, it's a, it's a classic thriller. You know, it's a classic horror thriller. Um, can you just briefly, I guess, describe to our audience like what Undergo is about? Yes, well, first, thank you so much for saying that that it's a great thriller. That means a lot. Um, now, Undergo is about four friends that are on a vacation and something's weird about this hotel in general. And they stumble upon this door. And when one of their friends ventured through, they try to go after her and it winds up being too late. And now they're stuck in this other realm that they have no idea how to get out. They're trying to stay alive. It's creepy, twist and turns everywhere you go. That it's it's a really it's a wild journey, you know, and it's really fun. And one of the unique things that you do um, in the book is each chapter is written from a like a different character's perspective. You know, you label um, right at the start of the chapter, this is Allie's chapter, or this is Nikki's chapter, or Maxi, or so on and so forth. What was it like kind of um, jumping from like one character's headspace to another? That was difficult, because you're trying to keep each of them in um, their own personalities. And sometimes when you're jumping, it can, um, it can get intertwined. But, you know, you you die, you you get to know your characters as you're creating them, that it kind of comes easily after a while. But I found it fun. I I enjoyed it because I got to know each of them and their strengths and their fears as I was writing their story. 
Um, one of the one of the things I I just kind of thought of this, and one of the things that I thought was a a kind of cute moment is all the girls uh, right in the beginning of the book they go uh, out for coffee, um, they go stop and get coffee, and each one of the girls um, has a different drink. Um, what do you think their coffee choices reveals about who they are? If so I I actually kind of base that um, on. A situation happened with me and my friends because we all are different personalities and I'm an iced coffee drinker and I'm constantly made fun of for it. Because even if it's like winter, 19 degrees out, I'm still getting iced coffee. So I just kind of thought it would be a funny moment um, to get to know the girls by their personalities and just to show that they're human and that they're deprived of sleep, you know? It's funny. I I'm the same way with ice cream. It's like that's my dessert, and there's never a time of year where ice cream is bad. And it could be like two degrees out, and ice cream is the way to go. Yes, thank you. <laughs> that's how I feel about my iced coffee because I I'm not like a caffeine fanatic, you know, five cups a day. But that morning coffee, I need to have it, or I'm not normal. <laughs> it's it's the essential part of the day. Yes. Um, <laughs> When you, so you kind of alluded to it. So like when you are creating these characters, do you base them off of real people or do these characters just like, are they just amalgamations and kind of mishmashes of of people that you meet? So a, a little bit of um, of the second one. So they're, they're not based off of anyone in particular, but I do kind of take a few moments, um, maybe... Uh, one thing that that one of them likes or a passion, I might use that from somebody that I know that I care about. Um, yeah, so it's not really based off of one person per se. Gotcha. So, like, in the beginning of the story, um, Ali is. Um, would you say? Would you say Ali is closest to you? Um, I. Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. I think it's a little bit of Maxi and Allie. I kind of mesh them a little bit because, you know, like when you're writing, you're trying to create the characters, you have to throw something that of yourself in them. So that that's kind of like what I feel like I did. I do feel like I am Allie in a lot of ways, but with the way Maxi is a little more grounded um, mm. and talking about her career, not about her parents, nothing like that. I've got asked that a lot. Um, but um, I, yes. Yeah, so I'm, I'm glad for that too. I'm glad for that too. Yeah, you know, um, that was, you know, that's something kind of interesting, you know, uh, you're, you're kind of alluding to also like Maxie does come from a diff more difficult background. Um, I won't spoil anything for uh, the reader, but you know, how do you approach uh you know, writing about more sensitive subjects like that? So I do write drama also. I have thought about doing like drama romance in the past. And for some reason, um, I always kind of like tragic characters, creating tragic characters and seeing, you know, how strong they are and the struggles that they have to go through. So I, I just kind of felt... Um, tying that in with Maxie. And I just kind of felt like it flowed with the story um, from more that we see when she's going through. It's hard to say without spoiling some things. Yeah, I guess. Um, really yeah. Because <laughs> um, you find out kind of why later on in the story. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, I, and again, like, you know, there's a lot of twists and turns, um, especially towards the second half of this. So like, it's, you know, it, there's there's a mystery element to this, too, in a lot of senses, because there's some things that you, you know, kind of leave purposely vague in the beginning for us to kind of peel the onion back later, um, which is fun. You know, it, it keeps it keeps you going. It keeps you very interested in the uh, in the story as it unfolds. Um, so, you know, so stay staying in the beginning of the story. Right. So the girls are the girls are in college right now. They're going into their junior year. They're they're ending sophomore year. Um, how is it compared to them? Like, how was your college experience? Were you the party animal uh, that, uh, you know, maybe Brenda is more like, or um, are you more like Allie and staying in the dorm room? So funny story about that. I actually didn't go to college. Um, okay. I 
I went to a part-time film program for two years, which was a lot of fun, but I wasn't like um, in college, but my friends were. So I was kind of with them while they were in college. And I would say I was more like Allie in that, like my friends were wanting to drag me to go out. And I was just like, no, I don't really want to go. Like, I wasn't the one to be like, no, let's go out tonight. They would be the one to be like, no, let's go. Your writing uh, speaks for itself. It's, you know, it's it's very good. Um, and I wonder if, you know, how much of that was self-taught for you then? Um, and who or what did you learn from and take influence from? So I always wrote short stories, um, even when high school. Um that's how I feel like I started learning writing and um, I started reading movie scripts and I just read a lot of novels in high school and just kind of studied from each one that I read. I would say my influences um, started with this author called Natasha Preston. She's a, a British UK author. I love her writing. I love her flow of the story. Um, that's, and then Going with film, I would say it's Lee Wannell, um, wow. Wes Craven, John Carpenter. They all were huge influences for me. Um, just the way that they told the story, their characters. And um, Stephen King also is another one. Um, I would say like a, all of them mixed together just kind of was like, this is where you should be. Like, this is what you can do. You have the similar, You, I mean, not, not that I'm comparing myself, but like you have kind of like the same mindset of horror and, you know, monsters. So why not try it? And the, and that's the best, that's the best attitude to have is why not try it? You know, um, cause all, all you can do is try um, and, and uh, develop from there, you know, cause you'll never actually get it down on paper if you don't. Um, and, you know, writing a book is freaking daunting. You know, I mean, I mostly uh, write screenplays now. I did start out writing books, but you know, over the years, I my my passions drew me more towards film and and television um, writing. But I mean, you know, writing a novel is is such a different animal um, in a lot of sense, right? Because when you're looking at screenplays, right, screenplays are very dialogue based. They're very action based. Well, you know, when you're reading uh, a novel, it's prose. It's, it's you know, getting into the character's thought processes. It's, um, you know, all their intricate feelings and their callbacks, you know, like a huge thing that I found in that books can do that um, screenplays often maybe struggle at doing is callbacks, right? Is like calling back to something from an earlier point in that character's life or an earlier point um, even in the book um, itself, but um, it allows you to go so much deeper in on their internal uh, struggles. How do you um, how do you approach like going into a novel? I mean, how much of it is in your head before you actually start, and how much are you like discovering just while while you're like on the page? Um. Every story to me is different. Like with Undergo, that came to me when we were in lockdown. Um, I was going for so many walks, just, you know, trying to fill the day. Um, and I just kept thinking of one scene in the novel over and over and over again to finally, like, I just got this urge of like, you should write this down because you're, you're going to lose it. Like what you have is kind of a lot. So just write it down. And as soon as my, I took the pen and I started writing that little scene down, everything else just kind of like, just came to me. And I just um, wrote from there. So it just takes for me, writing that one scene down, that's just over, over, over in your head. And then everything else just kind of flows so i'm i'm really curious and i'll cut it if it's a spoiler but what was the scene um it was when brenda is in the movie theater scene interesting that's an yeah. interesting starting point I, I know it's like you you didn't huh. even start in the beginning where you got to know them no it went right to the nitty-gritty <laughs> Interesting. I, I like that a lot. I, you know, it's it's funny, too, because in a lot of in a lot of ways, it's it's kind of how I approach some screenplays. Um, the screenplay that I uh, 
like won a couple of awards for it. also funny enough like also wrote that during the freaking pandemic because what else do you do um <laughs> it's, um but uh, you know when i wrote passion fruit um oh my god i just lost my train of thought i'm sorry it's so early um what were we just what were we just saying um, um about taking that one scene yes. and yes um with passion fruit like there was one scene in particular like right in the middle of the right in the middle like right as like the the finale starts is the scene that i kept thinking about and i was like gosh like that would be so cool to shoot and i wonder how that would uh look and affect an audience and then i'm like thinking like how did they get there like how did they get to that point and uh passion fruit just flew out uh you know so I, it's funny like i think as writers we must like ruminate on these stories for a while in our head maybe even before we're like consciously aware of them um yeah. I totally agree because even when I was thinking of like that movie theater scene, I was kind of like thinking, oh, what else could happen? Who is this character? Who is she with? Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, yeah. And I, so you're kind of already thinking of other, you know, scenarios and getting yeah. to know the person, but it, to me, whenever anyone asks me, how do you write? Where should I start? That's why I always say, go for the scene that um, is not at the beginning, not at the end, or like, like, like go go for like the, the climax scene, like, you know, like the scene that people are going to be talking about, if that makes sense. Well, what, what drew you uh, there, right? What drew you to the yes. story in the first place? So it gets you excited, right? Yes. And actually one person that I, I read right after I made it, um, that scene that I felt kind of like a connection with of like, wow, I feel like I did the same thing was the writer of you saw you saw the movie The Strangers, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. So so the the creator of it said that he came up with this story when um he was staying at a cabin and he's got a random knock on the door. And Oh, they open it and it was just a girl standing there that said, is um, is Tessie home or something? And he goes, I think you have the wrong house. And she walked away. Like, yeah. that's what made him say, no, that's a story. And, you, yeah. you know, funny enough, the the strangers, I think it was Tamra or Tem. Tam Tam yes. I, yeah. I, yeah, I, I remember seen it in a while. So I forgot. I remember I was a kid when I watched that and I watched it alone in the dark <laughs> in the middle of the night. And the cat behind me moved and I like flew off the couch. Like it was, it was probably pretty funny if it was caught on a ring camera. Uh, <laughs> oh so yeah, that's great. Right. You talked about um, uh, briefly doing, doing, you know, some education in, in film. Um, what was your interest in film and are you still interested in film? I'm 100% still interested in film. I'm working on my um, my screenplay right now. And um, I'm also working on another project with an independent uh, director and independent writer um, that I hope to, you know, start moving along towards the end of the year. Um, as far as film, I, I grew up watching movies. I love everything about it. I love the creation behind it. I watch behind the scenes. And I just know that it's somewhere I want to be. Like, I want to be a creator. I want to see, um, I think that some of my stories, like, I, I would love to see that um, on the screen. So that's definitely something I'm pushing for. Um, and we'll see how it goes. So um, moving away from the book a little bit and just kind of more into the world, you know, um, you're talking about how you're, you know, you watch those behind the scenes and now we're starting to see this, um, this kind of erasure of physical media, right? Um, Best Buy is no longer selling, uh, you know, movies anymore or CDs for that matter. Still selling vinyls. A um, little strange, but okay. Um, so, you know, as, a, as an aspiring filmmaker myself, like part of what taught me what I know is watching those behind the scenes. Um, and even like, um, maybe, you know, a little bit different, but I think similar in some ways is like the difference of holding a physical book, like Undergo right here, available at Barnes and Noble or Amazon, um, or like actually just reading it, um, on a tablet, 
Um, do you do you have uh, any thoughts as to like preserving physical media? Um, I do. I I um I love you know DVDs. I I love the all that extra stuff that you see behind. I think that we're kind of losing sight of um what makes a film, what um the people that are behind the scenes. People are just going for the fun and not really seeing the passion behind it anymore. And mm. that that that's kind of sad to me. I mean, there are a lot of people that, you know, dive deep and um do do their research on who is behind the scenes and who is the people that created this. Um but it it's making it more difficult to do that now. Yeah, of course. And like, you know, I'm someone that like also like and it maybe it's just like a maybe it's like a, just a psychology thing for me, but I feel like, you know, when I'm actually like reading a physical book versus like reading it on a phone or a tablet, I retain the book better. You know, like I I'm yeah. more in it. Um like I'm more locked in. I do agree with you. For me, it's just because I'm staring at a computer with writing all day. We're we're staring at our phones all mm -hmm. day. My eyes get my eyes hurt. I got blue eyes, so mm -hmm. the, it, you know, you know, you know how it goes with blue eyes. You get very sensitive. So I I'd rather stare at a book than looking at a tablet. I just feel more drawn, more connected to what's going on in the story than looking at a tablet. But you know, a lot of people feel that way about tablets than paperbacks so yeah I mean you know a lot of people say that you know they like streaming at home versus going to the theater too but you know like yeah. I I'm relatively certain looking back over the past couple years that the movie I've seen that the movies I've seen in theaters have left more of an impression on me than movies I've seen streaming on my couch yes I do agree because for me, when you leave a theater, and I still go see movies all the time at theaters, and the one thing I love is when I leave and you hear everyone around you talking about it. Of like, oh, that was good, or what about this? What was that? You yes. know, all all because this different stuff. Because there's that communal experience too, right? You yeah. know, even like, you know, I think people have also like lost this ability to talk in some ways, just like after it ends, right? You know, um, like. I don't think it should be weird to look at the person next to you and be like, oh, like, what did you think? You know, what oh, yeah. What did you think of that? Did you like it? You know, because sometimes they might have different interpretations or perspectives of it um, that you might like learn from. You might you might gain something from it. Um, I remember like, um, I don't know if you'd seen it, but uh, I saw The Green Knight um, in theaters, which is also it's a. Uh, I don't know if it's Chaucer. It's based off of some old English tale. Um, but um, I, it's an A24 film. And, you know, they're always a bit uh, open to interpretation. Definitely. And, uh, oh, yeah. And, you know, it was really interesting, though, because while I was leaving the theater, I heard this couple kind of arguing about it almost. They weren't, like, arguing, but they were like, you know, the, the man got a completely different interpretation of the movie than the woman. Yeah. And... Um, you know, like I talked to them about it for a minute and, you know, it was really interesting how they both came to their different perspectives on that. Um, yeah. You know, kind of like going back to books, though, you know, like just by me, um, you know, the nearest Barnes & Noble just closed. Um, and I try all the time to uh, recommend books, you know, that I like. Um but, you know, I feel like the same way, like, I try to recommend black and white movies to people, like, people are just completely, like, shut off to it these days. Um, what do you think is a good way to, like, inspire people to read, you know, because, like, you're you're young and it's very refreshing to see, like, somebody our age, like, writing and into reading and wants to do this um on a more like intellectual level so like you know what do you think is a good way to get people inspired to read more and pay attention to this kind of art um it's a good question because there's a few different ways I I kind of feel that can go one I think if they kind of get out of the illusion of social media world where mm -hmm. 
you know, how TikTok kind of consumes people's lives of watching small little videos. They're not, because a video can last like 30 seconds on TikTok, they're not open to watching an hour and a half movie or reading a over 300 page book. So I think if they can kind of separate themselves from that and um, um, wanting to engage in a story and not living in other people's lives, like li li living in fictional characters' lives for a little bit, I think that's how we can jumpstart it and um, get people to, you know, kind of, um, get to know themselves by separating social media. You know, one thing I, I sometimes like say to people is like, you know, I've never rage quit a book, you know, or I've never thrown my remote control at a movie, you know? Um, yeah. and you know, I find books and just, you know, prose in general, really writing, you know, to be such an escape, you know, it's, it's such a moment to not allow your brain to shut off but allow your brain to go someplace else. Right. right. And that's, sorry to me interrupt, but that, no, yeah. that's why um, I always watch a movie at night because when I'm feeling overwhelmed or stressed mm -hmm. or, you know, just any type of way, um, I get lost in watching a movie, putting, watching somebody else's problems and watching it being unfolded and the solution to it at the end. It's just a nice break. And I kind of feel like that's why I said social media. A lot of people escape to that, but I don't think it's really helping because I tried it and it doesn't, it doesn't fulfill everything that I would need to let my brain shut off for a little bit. Um, so, yeah, I, I just kind of think that we need to get back into realizing that film and reading books are an escape for us to get out of our reality that we're living just for a little bit. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. Um, so uh, we're coming to, I think, the end of my questions here. Uh, do you have any final thoughts or anything that you can maybe tease for the audience as maybe what you're working on? All right. Well, one thing I want to say, Passion Fruit was really good. I remember oh, watching you. it. Yes, I I loved it, and I can't wait to see more from it. Um, when yeah, from the stuff that you told me at the mixer, so I'm excited for that. Um, and as far as my 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 things, um, I am working on a next novel. It's in edits right now. It's coming out in October. Um, that one's called The Photo. I don't have any information about what it's about yet only because yeah it's still in the works hey, um, that's, that's a tease folks yeah. you, you got something coming and you're gonna have to come back here to hear more about it definitely <laughs> uh can we, um anything else oh um and i really hope by the end of this year i'm approaching in my film career because i do have one project coming i'm working on my solo project and we'll see how it goes all right well um this has been an awesome conversation. Um, again, sorry to drag you out of bed uh, to come on here, but um, I hope you had as much fun as I did. Um, I definitely did. The author is Amanda Russo, and the book is Undergo. Uh, for our Patreon viewers, this is what it looks like. You could find it on uh, Amazon or your local bookstore. Uh, Amanda, thank you for coming on The Works. Thank you so much. It's great talking. Great talking to you.